Um, and now he is co-anchor of Tech Check at CNBC. And he also has a podcast called Fort Knox, which is pretty great. I recommend you checking it out. And, and now I am going to turn it over to John. John, welcome and thank you for being here. Andy, thank you. Uh, you know, uh, always a pleasure to uh, collaborate and participate with you on anything. And yeah, I'm, I'm honored to, to be here and uh, speak with this great group. I can't, can't wait till it gets interactive. I guess I'm going to have to wait. Uh, but first, <laughs> I, will, I, I will talk a little bit really about um, some things that I've noticed about uh, crisis and leadership through my work. Uh, Andy mentioned uh, my Fort Knox digital program. And the idea behind that was uh, I have a lot of, of course, five minute conversations live on air on CNBC, but several years back, about five and a half, six years back, I realized that my reporting was getting worse. I was getting dumber in effect because I wasn't, I, I was kind of uh, formatting my interviews to the idea that I was getting a five minute product out of them. I, I wasn't going enough into the leadership backstories, into the motivations, into understanding more of the structures because I knew that I needed to end up with certain sound bites. And so formulated uh, Fort Knox to have really more of an hour long uh, conversation that would air digitally. And uh, what, what really came of that is I've had an opportunity to speak to hundreds of CEOs over the past several years and uh, of small companies, of large companies. And certain patterns have emerged in that. And uh, you know, in preparing for this, I really just went back and thought about uh, some of those conversations and, and the lines um, and, and connective ideas in how things played out for leaders through different types of, of crises. So when I'm thinking about leadership in crisis, I really thought about it in three buckets in terms of the types of crisis. There are kind of macro external uh, crises that hit, like the one that we're in right now uh, that, that is spurred on by Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, and the uh, coronavirus pandemic before that. So there were supply chain challenges before that that leaders were confronting. Uh, those are now exacerbated. There are inflation uh, challenges and, of course, the humanitarian uh, issues first and foremost for uh, companies that have employees in the region, um, employees have families in the region, and companies that are just sourcing materials from the region. So macro external crises. Then there are company and industry crises, um, the ones that are unique and specific to a, a particular company. Uh, think about scandals, um, people misspeaking, uh, you know, em employee issues or industry um, industry challenges st strategically that haven't been handled correctly in the past. And then a third category is just personal crises. Uh, there are crises that strike leaders individually in the process of their leadership and how they work through those or don't both affect them as leaders and potentially affect the entire company at the same time. So um, I think I'm gonna focus for this initial time on type two and three when it comes to crisis, not so much the macro external crisis, we can talk about that a bit later, but the company specific crisis and the personal crisis for the leader, which can at the same time uh, affect the company. So um, just, just this morning uh, on, on the show on CNBC, we're talking about one such crisis. Microsoft is in the process of trying to acquire a video game company, Activision Blizzard, for a big amount of money. It's gonna, I think it's around $60 billion. It's one of its biggest acquisitions ever. And the company that it's acquiring is troubled uh, in, in part because of sexual harassment um, uh, lawsuits within the company where uh, employees are saying there's been a pattern of behavior within the company over a long period of time, uh, in some cases by managers, uh, that managers have condoned or turned a blind eye to, they're saying, and that even the CEO knew about and didn't act upon, CEO Bobby Kotick. And, and what's happened today is uh, four senators have asked the FTC to intervene 
in uh, preventing this acquisition from taking place to put pressure on Kotick so that uh, th these workers' concerns can be heard. The, the dynamic in this, uh, in this company-specific crisis that, that catches my eye is between two leaders. There's Bobby Kotick himself, right, who, who is alleged to have known about various cases and not done anything about them. And then there's Satya Nadella, the CEO uh, of Microsoft that's trying to acquire this company. And what stands out to me about this is that Satya Nadella himself, when he was coming into uh, Microsoft uh, less than 10 years ago as CEO, had his own um, gender equity challenge to deal with, his own crisis, in fact. So um, to, to rewind a bit and put that into some context, I was interviewing, or I was set to interview Satya Nadella, his first broadcast interview as CEO when he was named. I'd interviewed him a couple of times before when he was a senior executive. And just before that interview was to take place, um, Satya was speaking to the Grace Hopper conference. It had to do with gender in technology. He was being interviewed by a member of Microsoft's board of directors and was asked a question about what women should do to ask for raises, right? It was about pay equity. And he, in what he would later uh, admit was a botched response, said in effect, well, in my experience, uh, women shouldn't ask for raises. They should just trust that the right thing is going to happen. You know, it's like karma and it'll come back to them and, and you know, et cetera. Those are the, the people I appreciate who have done that. Well, um, that didn't go over well. His interviewer told him, I, I actually don't think that's good advice and gave what the good advice was. And here's a new CEO who has not established himself as a person and what his ethics and beliefs are and has not established himself as an operator and how he's gonna lead this company. There are lots of questions about that. There were people who thought that Microsoft should bring someone in from the auto industry to run it, that nobody inside the company would be able to uh, not only fix the culture, which, which had some issues, but also uh, fix the strategy, which would seem to be lagging um, all sorts of other technology players. And uh, his response to that was to say, uh, after some reflection, that he was going to really work on Microsoft's policies and its approach to gender and other diversity issues and change and do better. Uh, fast forward now uh, several years, um, say seven, eight years, Bill Gates, who at the time was seen as the culture definer and leadership authority at the company, also accused of sexual harassment. Uh, Microsoft is, is dealing with that. But Satya Nadella, because of the way he led through that personal crisis moment has established enough credibility within the company, within the uh, industry, within the business community um, to, to be seen as a viable leader to lead through uh, this crisis. And so this sets up for me um, the, the question and dynamic of even before there is a crisis, there are experiences, ideals, demonstrated uh, patterns that leaders need to draw upon to then activate in the crisis. At the moment of crisis, it's too late, right? Um, it, it actually benefits Microsoft that its current CEO had been through that experience, had decided to set a certain sort of course on these issues. Uh, last year, as it was dealing with the Bill Gates challenges. And now as it's dealing with Activision Blizzard, it's seen as being an organization that in terms of the way that it is run and what its track record is, could help correct Activision Blizzard's issues. The senators are merely asking it to keep this acquisition target at arm's length uh, until it can face, by, and Bobby Kotick can face um, whatever corrective actions or, or even retribution uh, the employees um, are seeking uh, from a legal standpoint. So um, looking more at uh, industry specific and company specific challenges that, uh, that people are attempting to lead through. Um, I also think about uh, Intel and to, to just give some background there, uh, the current CEO of Intel is a guy named Pat Gelsinger. Um, Pat's story is that 
uh, when he was 18 years old, pretty fresh out of high school. Uh, he's gone to a, a little technical school. Uh, he tests well. Um, he's noticed by Intel, flies out to California his first time on a plane. He'd grown up on a farm in Pennsylvania, uh, Dutch country, and ends up finishing uh, his degree in California, rising up through the ranks at Intel to become the chief technology officer, uh, and is then unceremoniously uh, forced out because of some disagreements with the current CEO. He becomes eventually CEO of another company, VMware, uh, does quite well. And uh, about a year and a half ago, the board of Intel asked him to consider joining the board and then asked him in that, as part of that process to ask, ask him to consider being the CEO. So he comes back in at a time when Intel is not doing well. This is an industry strategic crisis that Intel finds itself in. Its chip technology is lagging behind companies it used to dominate, um, specifically AMD and NVIDIA. And the question on a lot of people's minds is, is it even possible for Intel uh, to catch up? So Intel is in a crisis and Pat Gelsinger has stepped um, right in front of it. His approach to leading in this situation is both unique and risky. And we haven't seen it play out yet. The, the unique part of what he's doing is he's being uh, very transparent about the company's strategic plans. He's making promises about what they will deliver and he's making uh, bold investments in what he says the company has to do. The reason why this is pretty unique and risky is that there are real costs uh, to A, making promises on timelines, because if you don't actually meet those promises, um, there's not a lot of room to wiggle and uh, your credibility takes a hit. And then on the scale of investment, he's talking about spending billions of dollars, really tens to the point of, of getting into the, the hundred of billions of dollars on chip manufacturing facilities um, when Intel has in the past fallen behind in chip manufacturing. So there are a lot of people who are hoping that he would move away from that, but he's saying, no, I believe we need to move forward in it and I'm gonna spend all this money to do it. So um, we, we can get into the, the personal uh, uh, ethics of Pat Gelsinger, which are rooted in his faith to a large degree. But this approach of not leaving himself a lot of wiggle room, not leaving the organization a lot of wiggle room, acknowledging the difficulty in Intel's position uh, and making, uh, setting forth a strategy that's going to make a key constituent that's investors very uncomfortable saying that, well, we're gonna spend tens of billions of dollars on manufacturing facilities in the US and Europe uh, in particular, and it's gonna draw our cash flows down to zero almost for a period of time, uh, but it's, it's essential to invest for the future. Um, that's something that a lot of leaders would hold close to the chest, to the vest, uh, but he's laying it out there. Now, we'll see what the impact is on motivating leadership to hit the benchmarks that he set. Uh, we'll see to what degree he, is, he needs to or is able to move benchmarks because of external events uh, like you know, Russia's war in Ukraine that is making uh, manufacturing and building things and even accessing materials for semiconductor manufacturing difficult. But this uh, level of, uh, what do you want to call it, transparency uh, or being very specific about goals and uncomfortable information uh, to me was unique. And uh, I'll mention uh, a couple more while we're at it. Uh, Adobe Systems, um, it's led by Shantanu uh, Narayan. And this is a company that has done very well in what's called cloud computing, uh, accessing software online. It's continually updated uh, and in a way that you're always on the latest version. You subscribe to it instead of paying for it upfront. Adobe was an early mover in that. And when I talked to Shantanu about it and why Adobe had made that move the way it did, 
I expected to hear something about, you know, the vision for how software was going to work primarily and uh, the advantage that it would put Adobe in. But what he told me, um, what he told me was that really during the financial crisis, uh, Adobe was caught sort of flat footed because it was selling software products like Photoshop for you know, five, six hundred dollars a pop as a box or as a download. And they didn't have uh, repeatable recurring revenue, which meant that um, when a downturn hit, they were left with their costs in a very uncomfortable position while still needing to show a level of profit. And he had to lay people off as CEO early in his tenure. And he said, John, um, I, I learned, I realized at that point that the first time, because of some external event, you have to lay off people, right? It's, it's the fault of, you know, of circumstance. Perhaps you can argue it's unavoidable. After that, it's a management problem. It's a leadership problem. So I needed to structure the company in such a way that I could protect the culture, I could protect the people. And so we looked for a way to have more recurring revenue and cloud was that. So the idea that it wasn't because of, you know, seeing the future alone or chasing the model of continually updating the product, it was because the organization in order to be healthy, in order to uh, weather future downturns in a way that protected the, the workforce, um, he felt that uh, he needed to make that shift. Um, and then uh, one more, because uh, I've, I've been speaking a lot at the, uh, at the organizational level about leadership in crisis and sort of the, these different considerations and ways that they've approached it. Uh, and this, is, this one's at the personal level. Um, I spoke uh, a few months ago with a woman named Amanda Richardson, and she's the CEO of a company called CoderPad. But before that, uh, she had fought her way up through the finance industry, eventually in Silicon Valley and startups. And she had really wanted a CEO uh, position. And finally, she was offered one at a company called Rabbit. Uh, thing was, at the time when she was offered the position, she was 34 weeks pregnant with her second child. Uh, she said yes, uh, got the job. The company was in trouble, though. There were only 10 months of funding left before it completely ran out of money. So she had to raise some money or figure out something to, to keep the company going. And, um, and 10 months of funding isn't really 10 months because uh, you, you got to have a plan in place before you hit zero. So it was really something shorter, like probably six months. Uh, so it turns out as she accepts this position, is working through it, her uh, son is born uh, a couple months into this job. Two days later, her father dies. And then uh, a deal that she had been working to save the company that was about to close, the banker calls to say that deal had fallen apart. Um, to, to layer on top of that, she's dealing with postpartum depression and now trying to um, carry a newborn, right, into meetings that she's having, trying to find another banker to save this deal um, and, uh, and dealing with all of the other uh, personal issues that she is. The uh, leadership lesson here is unusual in that the, the company collapses. She doesn't save the company, but what she gets out of that experience is both a sense of the importance in taking better care of herself uh, and the importance of recognizing that she is capable of more than she thought and that she needs to um, think about how to take care of her people so that they can achieve more. She's now the CEO of a different company and uses that experience and what she learned from it about her own limits and her own capabilities uh, in, in being a lot more personal about the way she uh, approaches challenges. So uh, more examples out there, but trying to offer just some layered examples of how um, experiences that leaders have uh, ahead of time combined with uh, their goals uh, and expectations for themselves and their companies lead to very often in my conversations, it seems, frameworks that then can be activated in moments of crisis, right? Um, but it's too late to come up with a plan 
um, and a lens on these issues on these issues when the crisis itself hits. Andy. Thank you for that, John. Uh, I'm gonna turn it now. I'd like to just have a conversation about this theme of leadership in crisis. So I welcome folks to either raise their virtual hands if you wanna ask John a question or you can type something into the chat. Um, and while you're thinking, I'm, I'll kick us off with a question. Um, I'm very interested and intrigued with this idea this, that you said, uh, basically once you get to the crisis, it's too late. Um, I, wanna, I wanna combine that insight with something else I've observed about leadership, which is it's one of these things that you, you have to sort of learn how to do by doing, right? So you gotta you got get into positions of leadership. You gotta be in those situations to develop those skills. You, you don't just read a book and become a better leader. So take those two things together um, for this is uh, maybe if you have a bit of advice for early leaders or people who are just starting their leadership path, it seems like if you can't learn how to lead until you get into positions of leadership or you start doing that kind of work, it's kind of inevitable that you're going to go through one of these personal crises of some in some way, shape, or form. It, does that seem true to you? Is it sort of should leaders sort of expect that they're going to hit some valleys pretty hard? I think that is true. I would also put alongside that, that a number of leaders that I've spoken to experienced good leadership themselves along the way. Um, one that comes to mind is uh, Sasan Gadarzi, the CEO of Intuit. And uh, he was coming up through, gosh, I don't want to get in an industrial company early on. And he was doing well. He was sort of uh, a, a um, headstrong young leader who was very open about the idea that he thought he could be a CEO one day, which struck a lot of people as being uh, way out there. And uh, he was kind of uh, working on a, a long-term project that was risky and took a long time before it showed any results to the point where the senior executives of the company wanted to come in and shut him down um, and, and may, may do away with his team. But his supervisor, his boss said, fought to no, give them a little bit more time. They actually ended up figuring it out. It became a huge grower. He ended up being uh, very successful at that company and later found out uh, what his mentor and supervisor had done. That stuck with him as an example um, in a way that informed him. Also, the, the Jennifer Tejada, the CEO of PagerDuty, uh, once was a, a young executive at Procter & Gamble. During that period of time, her father passed away. And the way management handled uh, and helped her through that time informed something in her about corporate culture that she still carries and that you know, she brings forth in leading this. Well, it's not a startup anymore. It's a public company, um, multi-billion dollar public company that she leads today. So those mentor relationships, other people's demonstrated leadership and values and approaches uh, can also have a big effect as you know a, a young or earlier leader is um, is moving through the ranks. I think uh, what I noticed from a lot of these people is they did take the time to derive meaning from those moments and really reflect on them and maintain the relationships uh, with those leaders who had been so effective for them beyond the time when you know that particular project or that particular reporting relationship was active. Thank you. Uh, here we go. We've got a question in the chat. Um, this is from Tony. From your conversations with presidents, oh, whoops, I just lost the question. Let me, from your conversations with presidents, CEOs, VPs, what are some key leadership characteristics, personalities, and or uh, intangibles uh, that they have. Any key lessons you can share with rising leaders, experienced leaders? Yeah, sure. I, I've been thinking about that. And a couple of them that I'll, I'll point out are uh, creativity and resilience. Now, uh, creativity, I don't mean ability to draw or, or, or dance necessarily, but I mean the um, ability and motivation to look at problems differently 
and attack them um, outside of the normal playbook. So I, I put um, Shantanu Narayan's move with Adobe toward the cloud in that category. I would also put Andy Jassy's move toward the cloud in that category. Andy Jassy is a CEO, uh, new CEO over the last year of Amazon. And um, one of his early jobs at Amazon, the job before the one he has now, was the CEO of Amazon Web Services, which is Amazon's cloud arm. Amazon is generally credited with being the company that turned this whole idea of cloud computing, subscribing to uh, infrastructure and getting access to those computing resources through the internet. Uh, Amazon really showed that that was possible on the infrastructure level, allowing companies like Adobe to then take advantage of it on the software level. So the, the creativity involved is that um, soon after the dot-com bust, uh, Amazon was trying to build its e-commerce business bigger and bigger into new categories. And uh, they had engineers working on all of these uh, new cap technical capabilities to enable that. And what management found was that they had multiple teams coming to them asking to build the same things with just these little differences. And they were frustrated um, because these costs were adding up and they weren't uh, collaborating with each other. They kept asking to add not only uh, more features, but more people to build those features. And so their thought was, well, if we could centralize this into a resource that then everybody can tap into and access, wouldn't that be better? And then once they figured that out from the internal challenge, they realized, well, other people could use this outside of Amazon if we build this central uh, computing resource. Um, and so th there's an element of creativity there and not only trying to address the micro problem of we've got overlapping requests for equipment, for people, for funds, but we can solve that um, at the company level. And then we can solve it at an industry and global economy level for others. It becomes a product externally, not just a solution internally. And then resilience, uh, we talk about that uh, idea a lot, but from the process of uh, pitching a startup and getting told no literally hundreds of times, um, to the ability to, I would call it, play their own highlight clips in their head when things are going wrong. Um, a dogged yet principled, one would hope, belief in the end result that they're driving toward, even when the near-term outcomes uh, don't necessarily point um, to the idea that that, that, that long-term outcome is going to happen. That resilience and ability to speak positively to oneself and to one's team um, based on replaying past successes uh, and understanding the value of those rather than focusing on past failures. Th those are a couple of things that stand out uh, to me with these leaders. Uh, got another question. Oh, uh, Greg, you have your hand up. Go ahead, unmute yourself. Sure. Lovely talk. We talk about leadership a lot. We want it to be replicable and we want it to be predictable. So we tend to pick examples that illustrate when it succeeds and sort of forget the ones that did the exact same thing and failed. So can you address the role of luck in leadership? Um, I think <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that I was speaking to an entrepreneur yesterday, a young woman named, uh, Fatima Diko, and she is the CEO of a company called sugar. And, uh, she was one of those people who has pitched, who pitched VCs, venture capitalists hundreds of times before getting the yes that she needed in terms of seed funding to get started. There are others who I've talked to who really didn't have to pitch that many people, you know, uh, Fatima went to Stanford. She's a, she's a black woman, went to Stanford, had to pitch hundreds. Um, there are others who I've spoken to who went to Stanford and met someone there who came and gave a talk and then offered them money on the spot. Um, so luck definitely uh, plays a role. I think part of the, the question and issue is when do we call time on the end of the story, right? Because so many, it, it's sort of cheating because in a way, if I'm, if I'm doing these interviews, then someone is currently at a point that could be defined as success. 
but I'm also always trying to find those points of failure uh, along the way where things looked really bad. If you had ended the story there, well, too bad. Um, take home what little winnings you had, you came in third place, what have you. But then how did they get beyond that point if they were, if they were able to? So I think that goes to the resilience question and also to the idea that um, a, a quality of, of leaders uh, that's, that's important, I think, is being able to think in narrative and the, uh, the willpower, doggedness, or, or delusion, depending on how you, you want to put it, to, to believe that you can call where in the narrative you are. Okay, now this is, this is bad, but we're going we're gonna to call this the middle of the story, not the end of the story. How can I get whatever resource I need, whether that's um, money, whether that is a, a team that believes in me, uh, whether that is um, some new uh, internal resources. One CEO I spoke with, uh, Ariel Cohen of Trip Actions, who um, kind of had a breakdown and had to completely step away from his company and went for days with no communication with anyone, just cut off from the world in order to, to recenter himself. And that was so necessary, he found, that now he does it every year. He goes for a period of days and just goes off the grid uh, for his mental health. Um, the, what happened before he went off the grid, the breakdown that he had, if you had ended the story there, bad luck, bad story, but uh, he, he was able to restart. So I think the, um, the people that we keep in our lives, both as advisors and certainly our families and closest friends who can help us to, um, to believe that we're at a point in the story where the story is recoverable, recoverable that does, Greg, become important. John, a, a question in the chat from Vanessa. Uh, speaking of dogged resilience, any thoughts on the failure of leadership in the Theranos case, uh, both Elizabeth Holmes and also the board? Yeah, um, this is this is a good question. Uh, this is that line between uh, dogged belief and fraud, <laughs> right? Like, are, are you believing something that is believable but just not manifested yet? So. Uh, it's not clear whether it can, it, the answer is yes or no, you just believe it can be yes. Or did you get a no and you just sort of slip that into a draw somewhere and pretended it didn't happen, right? So there's this, there's this space where there's possibility, right? Which is one thing to believe in a positive possible outcome. And then there's a, a space where it's delusion where you've actually gotten data that says no, but you're still telling people yes. And, um, there are people who have compared um, Elizabeth Holmes in defense of Elizabeth Holmes to someone like Steve Jobs who would get on stage during the keynote and present a product that was 80% working in a prototype form as if it worked 100% well and, and announce a launch date and the engineers were sweating because they knew they had this limited period of time to work out uh, the kinks. I guess his track record suggests that he was correctly judging the team's ability <laughs> to get those things done because they did get them done. Um, but, you know, and, and people have also said that for certain types of products, you're dealing with medical products uh, that people's lives depend on and your Theranos, um, having that kind of ambitious projection that's not based on established fact is ethically different than doing it with an iPad. I'm not an ethics expert, uh, so, so I don't know, but I, I know we have several in the room. Uh, let's see. Okay, another question in the chat from Venus. Since the vast majority of businesses in the U.S. are small businesses, have you held any interviews with small business leaders and if so, how did they differ in their leadership style? Um, I would say they differ in their experience portfolio more than in their leadership style necessarily. And what I try to do is speak to um, 
a, a pretty wide variety of uh, leaders and entrepreneurs. So I, I mentioned Fatima Diko. She's at a seed stage with her company. So she's got fewer than 100 employees. She would definitely uh, qualify as a small business. Even at the stage where she is, the rejection that she's faced, the pivot uh, that she's had to do are, are similar in structure to the sorts of challenges that larger businesses are, are facing. Just to, for example, um, pre-pandemic, the idea of the company that she was running was called Jetpack. And uh, the idea was on college campuses, um, students who need certain items, say a cell phone charger or an energy drink, there was a marketplace where they could ask each other for these things and there was really quick delivery because you know, it's, it's, it's a peer network and they're there on campus. And then COVID hit and students leave the campuses and her, her whole business is, is stalled and bleeding cash and potentially dead. Um, it almost does die, but then she has this idea for a pivot. Well, why don't I take this social network for living units idea and apply it to multi um, to multi tenant housing instead, essentially apartment buildings. And that's what sugar is, right? So she's applying that same idea to an apartment building, get to know your neighbors, create uh, a healthier social environment, landlords and managers pay for this. Uh, and they're able to collect rent through it. Uh, maintenance requests can flow through it. Um, and so it's a pivot that's been that's been good for her. But she's still a small business, right? She still has many rounds to go through before she'd even be close to having uh, an IPO or the, or the sort of uh, funding level and revenue level where she would be considered large. But I see the same kinds of uh, patterns of uh, study, pivot, resilience, uh, team building, and even shifting in the, the concept of the business itself. Um, without necessarily shifting the core idea, you know, in order to, to stay alive. Going to another question in the chat from Mike, uh, how do you think leadership skills transition across fields? If a leader is successful in one field, do you think those leadership skills translate to other fields? Huh, um, let me think if, if I can draw a great example of someone who has moved from one field to another. Well. Um, it seems that certain elements certainly do, but the leaders that I've spoken to that seem to do this best are the ones with a high level of self-awareness where um, they don't view their skill as necessarily being the product expert, but the team gatherer or perhaps the vision caster. Um, so they see themselves more as an assembler of team than necessarily the driver of action or star player. And I think when they're able to therefore put themselves in the right role as a leader and establish their credibility as being able to create success with that, then they do. And I, and I guess an example of that that comes to mind is a guy named Irving Fain, who's the founder and CEO of a company um, now, ba Bowery Farming. And they're an urban farm maker. So instead of growing food outside, they get these massive warehouses and uh, you know artificial lights and uh, grow lettuce or carrots or whatever in this very controlled environment. And that both the idea is cuts down on the use of water. Uh, you, you don't need pesticides because they don't let the bugs in there and uh, sustain environmental sustainability wise, these warehouses are located in urban areas. And so there's not the, the fossil fuel burn to get from where the uh, plants are, are grown to the grocery stores that eventually get them to customers. He started in finance, right? And led there initially. Uh, he transferred what skills were necessary to Bowery for indoor farming, but he has experts, right, product-wise, who are working on the, the nitty-gritty of agriculture and of marketing at the same time. So I think 
the level of self-awareness to recognize which skills uh, translate and the level of um, knowledge or outreach to be able to gather uh, team members to fill in the skills necessary for the new field um, are really what's necessary. Um, and another question message to me, which I'll ask here in a second, but before I do, um, you, I, thinking about what people can be doing to develop as leaders, I've, I've seen you in other occasions sort of talk about the idea that we shouldn't confuse leadership with formal authority. And so far we've been talking about leaders who are leaders, but also in positions of formal authority. Um, what advice do you have to people say at an organization like UC where there's, you know, there are a few people in positions of formal authority about trying to have those experiences where they can be developing leadership skills in their current role to prepare them for advancement? Yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated by this uh, dynamic, this interaction between authority and influence, because I think those are a, a couple of key elements of leadership. And you know, authority can put you in uh, on the org chart position to, um, to have the ability to pay people, to hire people, uh, to fire people, perhaps to have control over the budget um, that's necessary to make certain things happen, um, puts you in position hierarchically, perhaps to have relationships uh, with people who can influence outcomes or policy. But then influence is different from that authority because somebody at the very lowest level of an organization, if they have a particular set of skills, right, can, can get listened to, can be judged as credible or even expert, can inspire. And uh, even without the authority to, to say, this is my team, can assemble like-minded people, can start a movement within an organization to move it in a given direction. So it's particularly powerful when people with authority are able to grow their influence and people with influence, right, are, are knowledgeable enough about the mechanics, the culture, um, the reflexes of an organization to be able to either gain the authority themselves to pair with that influence or to access, right, the authority within the organization to accelerate a particular agenda. Hopefully that's good for, for that organization. But I think that difference and interplay between influence and authority is important because it's um, gained in different ways and granted for different reasons. Thank you. Um, I wanna pivot here in a second to talk about your project, um, the black experience in America. But before I wanna, this is R&I Week, Research and Innovation Week. Um, and <clears throat> how do you see universities, particularly research intensive universities, impact the direction of the tech industry and that interplay with leadership in tech industries? You know, I'm not sure I'm gonna have a great answer uh, to that question um, because I'm not really that familiar with the dynamics at that level of, you know, how the research influences the companies right now. But I, I do notice that um, certain institutions within tech have done quite well at technology transfer and at um, monetizing ideas within the student and professor population by not trying to hold on to them too tightly and claim absolute ownership from the beginning, but having more uh, of, of an ecosystem mindset. You know, MIT uh, and Stanford in particular keep coming up in my conversations, but I'll try not to get over my skis and, and um, try to give advice about, about a research institution. Uh, I don't know. Um, well, I do, I do I, I'd like to, unless there are any other questions, I'd like to pivot to, talking about uh, your project, The Black Experience in America. I was particularly interested in this project when you started it uh, almost a year ago. 
because where I was before, we were tasked with doing leadership development. And when you were talking to me about this project, I was like, a lot of these kids that I'm working with in leadership development, this is very, very important information for them to have if they aspire to be leaders uh, regarding the Black experience in America. So could you just tell us a little bit about you know, the origins of this project and, and where it is now? Sure, um, and thank you. Uh, so this, this project, uh, I, I'm not uh, an anthropologist, I'm not a historian, but I am a father. And the origins of it were after George Floyd was murdered, uh, I was thinking about what to say to our boys. We, we've got two sons, they're now 11 and 13. And as a journalist, I don't protest or march or put up yard signs, um, no really uh, show of external political opinion. So, you know, we were talking about how people in town were, were marching and protesting. And I, of course, said, you guys are free to do that, but I um, won't go with you. And I thought, well, what can I do? And we've, many of us heard about the talk that so many Black parents have with our kids about police and authority and bias. And I'd had that. So it wasn't about doing that. Uh, what I wanted to communicate was more long form. It was more about uh, a course, about being Black in America. And my sons are also uh, Korean American. So they're African American and Korean American. My wife's family uh, is from Korea. So I, I wanted to introduce them to the thinkers and ideas and dynamics within our society that have had a big impact for me and that I think drive a lot of uh, culture and thinking, but I didn't want to tell them what to think. And so my approach was to try to put something together that gave them some uh, principles, some ideas, some thinkers to um, build off of and grow with as they seek their own answers. The structure ended up being 18 uh, lessons, about an hour to an hour and a half long, um, split into three, what I call cycles. Uh, the first part um, is, is called uh, double consciousness. So it's really centered in on that idea from the souls of black folk and W.E.B. Du Bois, um, that there's this tension between being black, African and being American at the same time. And uh, as an African-American, you're not entirely allowed to feel fully either. And so how does that get reconciled? So, um, you know, I, I know that my experience growing up in mostly the 80s and 90s uh, was very different from my mom's who grew up in the segregated South. And I, I know that she thought that she was seeing the world clearly. I thought I was seeing the world clearly. And so I'm sure my boys think that they're seeing the world clearly and that I, you know, dad, you don't understand things aren't like that anymore. So how could we find a common ground in which to look at what's happening in society? And so my thought was double consciousness, we might feel it differently in different generations, but we feel it. So let's explore those ideas. So, you know, started off looking at uh, the souls of black folk itself and the, the concept of double consciousness, even then looked at Shakespeare and the play Othello, because really, when it comes down to it, to me, that play is about double consciousness, even before America as a country existed, or even before the first African slaves arrived in North America, you know, you had um, the Moor uh, uh, who, who was operating in Europe, highly competent and yet not allowed to belong, right? Divided um, to the degree that it drove him crazy is the message of the play. So how does, what does that mean in today's society where even your competence, even though people are saying that you're great, you know, if you don't understand the way society works, it can break you down psychologically. Then we also go through and look at gender. Um, there's a lesson called The Bluest Eye, looking at Toni Morrison and beauty standards, um, a lesson called Masks, looking at uh, Maya Angelou and Paul Lawrence Dunbar and uh, the, the interplay between poems where they talk about shields that, that we put up sometimes to deal with um, the, the pressures in society from a perspective of race. And then, uh, you know, later on, we even uh, go into the, the movie Into the Spider-Verse, right? Because 
Miles Morales uh, is, is really a, a look at double consciousness because um, he's a, a person of color. He's actually black and Latino. And he's this student going to an advanced high school where he doesn't really want to be going there because he wants to be with the kids in the neighborhood, right? So he's having that issue that we know so many young people uh, of color in particular go through. Um, and then he's also Spider-Man. So maybe it's triple consciousness, right? But they're really able to relate to that and the tensions and the, the need to have some kind of healing and unifying whole in one's sense uh, of self. So that's the first section double consciousness. Second section is called How We Got Here and looks at ancient African civilizations up to the Civil War. The idea is not to just focus on slavery and civil rights. We started with identity and we start before the slave trade, looking at the civilizations that existed in Southern and East Africa um, before the slave trade began. The health of those, the culture of those, the, the science in those, the trade right, between not only those two areas, but the trade between them and Europe and between them and Asia. Um, and then to, to fast forward, uh, the third portion is called false restarts. And uh, those last six lessons, based on this pattern that I see in American history, where there have been these moments where in terms of race, there's a hope and expectation that we're going to take three steps forward, big leap. So you know, emancipation after the Civil War. But then there's botched reconstruction, two steps back, right? Um, not three steps back, there's still progress being made, but not quite as much as was hoped for. And then you can, you know, look ahead at the Civil Rights Movement and the, you know, busing backlash that happened after that as various localities were trying to make good on the legal promises and how the on the ground cultural realities clashed with that, three steps forward, two steps back. Um, you can look at the era of multiculturalism and magnet schools and, you know, the top line test scores look good, but then under the microscope, when you look at the actual outcomes for a lot of the kids of color in those schools, not as good as advertised. And then my intent was looking at the, the post George Floyd murder moment where there were a lot of corporate promises being made and a lot of people saying, oh, well, it's all going to be different now. My message was, well, th there's a pattern here. So uh, don't lose hope, but don't expect that they're just going to be three steps forward and not two steps back, because this is how it works. And I, I think we can pretty much all agree that we did have those two steps back uh, pretty quickly and are perhaps still in that space now. Andy. Thank you. All right. So um, if anybody's interested in uh, the Cincinnati Ethics Center is going to pilot uh, an, a a way for you all to take this course for free if you would like just uh, there's a form there in the chat just give me your name and email address and i'll make sure you get included when we announce how to access that course uh, we'd also love your feedback on the sessions so feel there's another form there i hope you take time to fill that out and uh, we've got two more events today uh, we've got the ethics of academic ethics and equity in academic publishing liz scarpelli the uh, director of University of Cincinnati Press and I are going to facilitate a conversation together on that topic. That's an area that I have extreme interest in, personal interest in as well. And then we have the Hutton Lecture tonight, Confronting the Global Crisis in Knowledge Production in Healthcare. Uh, that's this evening. Not too late to RSVP to any of those. There's a link to RSVP to that. And uh, John, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it as always. Thanks for having me. And Tony, uh, Margo, do you have anything to close us out before folks head out? Just thank everyone for uh, your time and thanks for joining us today. Have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you all.